I'm Pam Cooper, co-founder of Boosterville, and I'm here to tell you that school fundraising stinks. Sixty years ago, my grandma was a teacher whose students sold magazine subscriptions to buy library books. Thirty years ago, my mom's marching band kids were pushing cheese and sausage to raise money to appear in the Rose Bowl parade. Ten years ago, it was me with wrapping paper and cookie dough for classroom supplies. I know school fundraising. It's a broken industry, but Boosterville fixes it. Your school gets the money you need, but so do the local businesses within your community. Boost your school while you boost your local businesses. Buy local. Boost local. Choose Boosterville. Representing the valued T in PTA, he will share with us some of the successful ways he has engaged students and their families in reaching their true potential and inspired his fellow teachers along the way. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished educator, Jeffrey Charbonneau, the 2013 National Teacher of the Year. National Teacher of the Year. Some people mistakenly think that that must mean I'm the best teacher in the nation. I'm not the best teacher in the nation. I'm not the best teacher in Washington State. I'm not the best teacher at Zilla High School. I'm not even the best teacher in my building, and there's only two of us. <laughs> you see, I want you to stop for a second and think about that best teacher label for just a minute. Who is the best teacher in your life? was it? For each of us, it's somebody different. And now I want you to think, what was it that they taught me that made them the best teacher? You probably did not just now think negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. <laughs> probably the quadratic formula was not the most important thing that they taught you. Probably. Probably it was something very different. Probably that best teacher in your life was someone who inspired you, who gave you a vision about who you wanted to be, and had confidence in you and your abilities. It was probably the best teacher. For some of us, it's mom or dad. For some of us, it is an English teacher or a science teacher. But it's probably not somebody that made us memorize formulas. Instead, it's that person who put you first. That's a great teacher. You see, the best teacher in the United States is not me. The best teacher in the United States is the person that meant the most to you as an individual. Because education is an individual endeavor, isn't it? Isn't it about your relationship with learning? That's what teaching is all about. So yes, I am from Zillow, Washington. We're a tiny, small, little rural agricultural community. Only 400 students in the high school, 912. We're 50% free and reduced lunch. We're in a minority majority school. And we're in the heart of wine country in Washington state. Yes, there is a desert in Washington. It's not just Seattle and rain and Starbucks. Though there are a few Starbucks around. There's a few. Walk a mile, you'll find one. You see, in Zilla, I teach chemistry, physics, engineering, and architecture. So I'm a nerd. I, yeah. I'm the guy that's supposed to care more about quantum mechanics than I do about students, right? Because that's what good science teachers do. Good science teachers worry only about robotics and rocketry, right? Or maybe not. You see, ironically enough, content to me is not the most important thing. Content is not what drives my instruction. Instead, the most important thing to me is building a positive relationship with my students. That comes first. I'm the guy that worries about where my students come from. I want to know about their family history. I want to know what it is that they value. 
in their household. I want to know what it is that they talk about at the dinner table, if they're talking around a dinner table. I want to know that about my students first, because if I know that, then maybe I can actually make a relationship between that and quantum mechanics. It might be a little tough, but that connection can be made. So I say that to groups, and I say, you know, student relationships is the most important thing. So then in the back of people's minds, they go, oh, so you're the guy that doesn't worry about content, and you're the guy that just plays in the classroom all day. Uh-uh. It doesn't work that way. You see, when you know more about the students, you can take them much farther into content than you've ever taken them before. Every single one of the classes that I teach counts for college credit. I'm an adjunct faculty member at three different universities. My engineering students get credit through Yakima Valley Community College, my chemistry students get credit through Eastern Washington University, and my physics students get credit through Central Washington University. It's straight up tough. It's hard. It's difficult. And I make it as absolutely difficult as possible. Why? Because I didn't used to. You see, when I started teaching 12 years ago, I did what all teachers do. I thought. I went to the file cabinet, I pulled out a worksheet, and I gave it to the kids. And then I asked later, why? And I didn't have a good answer. And my students were bored. Because after all, how many times since seventh grade can you talk about how atoms are made out of protons, neutrons, and electrons? <laughs> Boy, kids, isn't this exciting today? We're going to talk about Lewis dot diagrams for the third year in a row. Do you remember doing dot diagrams? Anybody remember that? You put the atom in there, you put the drum little dots? Why? I don't know, because the teacher said so. That's why. It's far more important than that. You see, my students were bored. There's two different reactions that you could have. You could say, well, they're bored because they don't like this subject, and so I need to water down the material. Or you could take the alternate approach and say they're bored because I haven't pushed them hard enough. So I decided to push a little bit harder, and a little bit harder, and a little bit harder, and a little bit harder. And the next thing I noticed, the more difficult I made my classes, the better the grades, and the more students signed up for the classes, and I had no discipline problems. Why? Because they were learning something. Because they were engaged, they wanted to be there. See, that's the secret to education is that by placing content secondary and student relationships first, you do way more content. Which seems so odd, doesn't it? So why am I here? Why did they pick me? I teach chemistry, physics, and engineering. Because of that, I'm also the assistant drama director at our high school. <laughs> they go hand in hand. But they really do. You see, everybody thinks that I'm the STEM teacher, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. They think that that's what I'm focused on. Well, it is part of what I'm focused on, but I'm also focused on the A. It is STEAM, not just STEM. It doesn't stop there. You know, I've been around for a little while now, 12 years. We used to care about something else for a while. Anybody else remember when we worried about reading? When reading was important? I don't know why that got dropped off the face of the planet. Really, it's not about STEM. It's not about STEAM. Let's make a stream. Let's make a stream of knowledge where all of it is valued. You see, I want students to know Dante. I want them to know Euripides, Eumenides. I want them to know Kant and Rousseau and Locke. I want them to know all of those at the same time that we talk about quantum mechanics and robots. Because I am a robot guy, I started something called the Zillow Robot Challenge. I'm really kind of lying when I say I, though, because it was much more of a we. I made one of those mistakes in life that maybe you've made. I said, what if? You ever done that? You ever said, what if? The problem with saying, what if, is that if it sounds good, somebody's going to make you do it. <laughs> so I said, what if? What if we could start a robotics competition in the Yakima Valley of Washington State, a very low socioeconomic status area? 
What if we could start a robotics program where we bought robot kits, sent them out for free to any student, any school that wanted to participate. They could keep those robot kits for six to eight weeks, come back on competition day, and we could see who the biggest nerds in the valley were. I said, what if? And then the parents in Zilla said, let's make it happen. So with a bunch of parents, we formed together to form something called the Zilla Science Boosters. Hey, a sports can have a boosters program, can't science? Yeah, why not? We lovingly referred to ourselves as science cheerleaders for a while. Because that's what we wanted to become. We raised over $25,000 in five years' time. We bought over 100 robot kits, and we do exactly what we set out to do. We send them to other schools free of charge. They come back, and they play on competition day. And then we recycle the kits and send them out again. We do it twice a year to high schools and middle schools. 75 different school districts have participated, almost 2,000 students in the five years. And we continue to grow. That's not me. That was us. That's what happens when teachers and parents work together. To envision something. To think about how they could change education beyond a bake sale. Bake sales are good. I love eating them. I love participating in them. But isn't that so much bigger than that? Isn't the relationship with, between parents and teachers so much greater than that? Isn't the potential so much larger? It really, really is. So yeah, I'm the STEM guy. I'm the robot guy. I'm also the yearbook advisor. <laughs> Small school. <laughs> but see, yearbook and engineering do go hand in hand. You might not have thought about it before. Yearbook and engineering are the same thing. We're worried about design and layout, x, y coordinates on the page, how much size you're, you're taking up. You're worried about whether or not you have three times, each student in the yearbook, three times or not. That's one of the big focuses that I have. I want every single student in my school to be in that yearbook at least three times. Why? Because there's one thing that you care about when you get your yearbook. There's one thing. The index. It is a social status. I'm in the yearbook 17 times. I'm in the yearbook five times. Every single kid needs to be in there. Because it's their book, isn't it? It's your book. It's not the years. It's your book. I see my participation in your book as an allegory to my participation in students' lives. It's got to be individualized. It's got to be about each and every one of the people in the seats. It's got to be about them as individuals. And if we can stop and think about education that way for a while, I think we'll be in a far better place. So what do I teach? It's not about the chemistry. It's not about the physics. It's not about drama. It's not about yearbook. It's about one thing and one thing only. It's about confidence. It's about confidence in my students. I haven't always known that. Six years ago, my life changed dramatically. His name is Andrew. <laughs> Andrew came along six years ago. And if you're doing the math, six. Huh, yep. I'm now the proud proud father of a kindergarten graduate this year. Uh, Andrew changed my perspective on life slightly. Slightly. Yeah, you remember the first one, right? Changes your world a little bit, doesn't it? Takes your heart, rips it in two. Half of my heart is right here. The other half wanders around somewhere. He runs around, he plays. He teaches me what it's like to be humble. I'm, after all, the science teacher in Zilla High School, teaching advanced classes. And my six-year-old knows more about dinosaurs than I do. <laughs> A little bit of humility there. When he goes to school, what do I want? What do I want his teacher to give him? Beyond everything else in the world, what is the most important thing for my son? for your sons and daughters. I think it's confidence. I want them to know that they're special, that what they can, what their dreams are, what is lying in front of them is attainable, whatever that is. 
That's the most important thing. If I can teach my students confidence, then I think I've done my job. I look back on my career, and I see lots of different folks who graduated from the school that I once taught. And I can see doctors, and I can see nurses, and I can see pharmacists. I also see beauticians. She does my hair each week. She does a great job. What I'm mostly worried about is they choose a career path that is important to them. You see, it's not my job to create the next generation of scientists. It's my job to help create the next generation. It's not just about science. It's not just about arts. It's about the holistic approach. Four years ago, that really rang true. My wife was in labor. She's laying there on the bed, whatever, and I'm worried. We're in the hospital. She was doing something. I don't know. <laughs> Baseball games on. That's a lie. That's a lie. <laughs> she would have killed me. She's laying there in the labor. I'm a science teacher, and I'm watching the heart rate monitor on our daughter. I'm noticing something. Beeps are going along just fine. And then there's pauses. And so I called for the nurse. The nurse came in and explained that that's a relatively normal thing. When there's contraction, the heartbeat will stop momentarily, and then it starts back up again. And I said, okay, but watch how long it's taking. So she called the doctor, Dr. Smeagy. When the doctor came in, the nurse walked out. Dr. Smeagy looked at my wife and said, ah, oh, this, is, this is normal, it's no big deal. And you can tell when you're watching a doctor, their expression on their face, right? If the expression is kind of lackadaisical, then you know everything's okay. And everything is fine, and Dr. Smeagy walked to the door, and she just got ready to leave. And I did it again. And the heartbeat stopped. And there's that look that a medical professional can give you when you know, oh, Dr. Smiggy then said, I think we should take this baby now. Push. And she wasn't talking to my wife. She was talking to me. Push? Me? The bed. Went back, got behind the bed, pushed as hard as I could, and we raced down that hallway. Hospitals are slow moving places, aren't they? <laughs> Man, everything is slow until a doctor says now. I don't know where these people came from. I kid you not, there's a vortex in the wall that opens up and nurses flood out. So we're running down that hallway and I'm pushing, suddenly people were descending upon us. I was stopped at the operating room doors. I turned and someone is dressing me suddenly. I'm getting a gown on, a cap, mask. By the time I met my wife inside the surgery area, they had a sheet up so that I couldn't see past her belly and she was already unconscious. From the time that the doctor said push to me, to the time that she was lifting my daughter out of my wife's belly, was about three minutes. I have no idea how they did it. No clue whatsoever. As I was sitting there at the head of, of, of my wife, I couldn't see. I felt a tap on my shoulder. They said, it's okay, you can stand up. I stood up just in time to see the baby being lifted out and handed off to somebody else. Now keep in mind that everybody in the room right now looks like this. That's <laughs> all I can see. And this woman who is attending to my daughter gets my daughter to cry. I know, okay, you're gonna be all right. And then the woman says, Jeff? And I said, yeah. <laughs> she pulls back, it's the mom of one of my best friends from high school. And then somebody else behind me said, Charb? <laughs> Fear took over. <laughs> you see, my name is Mr. Charb, but my students call me Charb. And three of them were in the room. <laughs> Two. I was really excited for that. <laughs> My perception changed about the third one. <laughs> Not 
That's what I teach. I don't teach students who stay in school. I teach people who are right here with me. I teach people who are literally saving what is most important to me, saving the life of both my wife and my daughter. You see, we get so caught up sometimes that students are these entities that are going to stay there forever because they're constantly being filled up. I don't know what happens, but I graduate one set and another one comes in. <laughs> and so I think these students are always the same, but they're not. They are people, and they're right there next to us. And they're working right along with us. And if we realize that, if we realize that we are not teaching this entity out there, but instead we're teaching us, then suddenly it becomes slightly more important. I have to start thinking back whether or not they remembered everything in biology. <laughs> and then I realized it wasn't my job to teach them biology. It wasn't really my job to teach them chemistry or to teach them physics. It was far different than that. My job is to give them the confidence and the ability to move forward to learn the material that they need to learn later in life. That confidence to walk into a post-secondary education. And I do say it that way. It's not just college. College, certainly, universities, sure, trade schools, yes. Advanced certification of some kind, that's what it's about. If I can give them that confidence to move forward, then I've done my job. You see, I hope that that's what my students get. I hope that they get confidence from me. What do I get in return? I have one of the best paid jobs in America. Yeah, the finances are a little weak. <laughs> but when I walk around my community, and I see the faces, and I see the families. I know that for some of them, I've changed their life arc. And if I can do that, then I've made a difference. But there's a trick. I don't do it by myself. I do it with the help of families. You see, the only way that I'm able to get that confidence into folks is by, again, knowing my students first and knowing their families. It's not my job to tell a family or to tell a student what's important in life. That's not my job. Mom, dad, family dynamic, that's their job to explain what's most important in life. What my job is is to understand what's important in my students' lives and then show them how I can help them reach those things that are most important. So if there's one thing that I could ask of you today, if there's one takeaway from this whole thing, it is this. Teachers need your help. We need you. We desperately need you. We need you to tell us what's important to you. Because if we're telling you what's important, the whole system is screwed up. Don't you think? I think it's more about parents helping to teach us what's most important to your individual families. And then we can work with you to figure out how to get your students to where you want them to be. So what do I want you to do specifically? Parent-teacher conference time. Don't let the teacher get in and out of there in three minutes. Uh-uh, none of that. Take the time and convince those teachers of what it is that's important to you and your family dynamic. If you can do that, and if you can share that message within your communities, boy, what a wonderful place this will be. And lastly, while you're sending that message, look around. Look around your community and look around your schools. And help to recognize what's going right. You see, I think we have a little bit of a problem in America from time to time. And I think that problem is we focus on potholes. We're driving down that nice interstate, whether it's I-5, I-90, I-737,000. We're driving down that nice road, and we hit a pothole. Never mind the fact that we just drove for 300 miles without hitting a single one. Rare. I, if that's the case in your state, then great. <laughs> we just drove a long distance without hitting a pothole, and then we hit one. And it ruins our entire trip. Because we hit a pothole. And we ignore the fact that that roadway has been established, and it's doing pretty good. I think education is the same way. There's an awful lot going right. Are there potholes along the way? Absolutely. We need to fix them. But please help celebrate some of those successes as well. To the National PTA, thank you so very much for the work that you do. From the bottom of my heart, which means from Andrew and from Michaela, 
thank you for continuing to improve not the education for your own kids, but the education of all kids. Because that's what this really is all about. Thank you so very much. something that aligns perfectly with our mission and I think it puts the perfect exclamation point on the close of our convention. Thank you so much. Just a little something to always remember, National PTA, you have our full support. Thank you Congratulations. so much. Congratulations. No more handouts for schools. Instead, waves of new customers seeking out your business, intentionally making new purchases locally, knowing a portion benefits their school. That's Boosterville. Sell local, buy local, boost local. Boosterville.